Have you thought this through? No way will that work. Are you sure? Is there any money in that? You'll never make any money doing that. How are you going to pay the mortgage? Just get a job. Are you going to try and settle that? Why can't you be normal like everybody else? For your parents wants to. The savvy entrepreneur to the rescue. Congratulations. That really turned out well. I'm really good job. I'm really I'm really You know, I wish I had thought of that. I never thought of anyone this. How did you do that? I'm so glad you're here to your dream. I wish I had the courage to follow my dreams. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Doris Nagel, and I'll be with you for the next hour talking about all things entrepreneurship. I have a guest this week who's going to talk about a very important topic, so you'll definitely want to stay tuned. We'll talk about data security and all sorts of ways that businesses can protect themselves, some of the issues that are out there, some of the things that can happen, and as I said, ways that you can protect yourself. So if you're an entrepreneur, this show is for you. I'm a crazy entrepreneur myself, and I'm here because I love helping other entrepreneurs. The show has two goals, really. First is to share helpful information and resources, things like how to protect yourself from phishing and identity theft, other kinds of data security issues. But the goal is also to inspire and to maybe make your journey as an entrepreneur a little bit faster and easier. I don't know about you, but I found that being an entrepreneur sometimes is kind of lonely, kind of confusing. Don't always know where to turn for help. And so I have gifts on the show to help provide information as well as sharing their stories with us. So my guest this week, his name is John Hightower, but he goes by the name of Professor Black Ops, and he is joining me by phone today from Indiana, and he's going to talk about his business and some of the issues that he and some of his clients have come across, and ways, as I said, that you can protect yourself. So, Professor Black Ops, or PBO, as you said, I can call you, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and you hit it correct on the head. We're going to hit a little privacy, a little cybersecurity, and we know there's hackers out there and bad people. So we're going to help your audience get a little better and just uh, take it down to the uh, bear studs. Don't be scared of it. It's super easy. Let's make it happen today. By the way, this is really geared for small businesses, one, maybe to 10 employees. And that's a lot of you out there. And so this is really geared for you. But, you know, before we dive into that, Professor, why don't you talk about how you got into IT and data security and a little bit of your background and how you got to be pretty experienced in this area. Okay, not a problem. We're going to have to go way, way back. I got my bachelor's in computer science in 1990. I got my MBA in 1995. I started out as a junior programmer. Um, I worked in every industry. I probably had 30 jobs. So I worked in every industry from, I worked in a Fortune 500 pharmaceutical company, Fortune 500 insurance company, trust and insurance, uh, just a myriad of companies. But my claim to fame is I actually work for the Department of Defense, uh, right, which is one of the biggest agencies wow. in the world. And they're really about security. So that's how I really cut my chops and got really into cybersecurity. The government was really getting hacked. I was a consultant out there. So they trained everybody. They brought some of the top uh, guys in the world to train us. Um, I used to actually pay retirees their um, checks. So we want to make sure they got paid. The quickest way to get a soldier to come home is his wife not get paid or they don't get their proper benefits. So I still say that today. My my number one thing is to pay the warfighter. We used to say that. I'm like, oh, I don't even work there anymore. But uh, on a serious level, that's actually where I've uh, and I worked out there for 10 years. So out there, I probably had uh, 10 different jobs, everything from web admin, database, uh, operating system. So I did a myriad of things and got trained by the Department of Defense. So that's kind of where I, 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 I get my, um, go and, ahead. And now I guess you consult really helping out various organizations who need uh, your help, right? 
A hundred percent. I actually work for a small consulting company and they, uh, you know, I help other companies. My current uh, big company right now is the uh, Department of Revenue for Indiana. Once again, uh, trying to make sure that taxpayers don't get their identity stolen or their tax return fraud is super big in, in that area. So that's another one of my specialty. They actually report to the IRS. The fancy word of that is IRS Pub 1075 is basically how do you harden a computer system so the uh, tax repair doesn't get their um, tax return or identity stolen. So um, I usually do big organizations, but we can uh, break it down for the little guy, too. But I, I usually do big organizations for big money. So <laughs> that's know, my and, Bailey and wig. That's, <laughs> and that's really a serious business, too. I mean, yeah. um, a friend of a friend of mine got a notice that they hadn't made their payment mm-hmm. And it turned out that somebody had actually gotten a hold of the return and had changed the return. It was crazy. It was a it was a ginormous mess for them. So I'm sure that kind of stuff happens all the time. More than you, more than shit. Oh yeah, that's a a billion dollar industry, which is sad to say. And uh, we know in that industry, as soon as the first day to do tax return. 10% of those are going to be fraudulent by somebody trying to steal somebody else's tax return with fraud. You are, you have got to be kidding me. 10%? No, it's, a, it's high. It's high. Especially uh, when you get to the, uh, I got to be careful. I got to think it. Smaller states really struggle because they don't have the funds to get the top security guys, security programmers, and the top software is super expensive. So yeah, it's, it's a high number. The tax industry, industry has gotten a lot better over the years, but 10 years ago, you can easily steal a hundred million dollars. I was talking to guys, I used to joke and say, we're on the wrong side. <laughs> we're on the wrong side of this. Yeah. Um, once again, the, the stakes have gotten better as, as it happens more. And um, there's an industry that helps them, but 10 years ago, oh, you, people were stealing a hundred million dollars. Easy. Well, you, you, know, you can't, you can't see me, but my, uh, my jaw is about <laughs> dropped all the way to my computer here. That's a huge number, and it's pretty yeah. scary. Yeah. Well, let's uh, circle back to the small businesses. So that's basically a lot of Main Street businesses, right? That's mm-hmm. most what I would call giggers, and there's a lot of those, especially these days out there. That's probably most tradespeople, right? Um, yeah. Other than the bigger companies, but, you know, the small plumbing companies and electricians and painters and people like that. Uh, and it's certainly most little startup companies. I think most of us, the first thing that comes to mind is really identity theft, right? And I'm sure a lot of us have had personal experience with what that can mean. Somebody makes fraudulent charges on your credit card. But I'm guessing identity theft for businesses is a potential risk as well. And it, what does identity theft look like for a small business? Oh, that's an excellent point. Identity theft for everybody is number one, not specifically small business, because once people get identity theft, they can impersonate you. So on a small businesses, I've seen everything from I impersonate you, go out on um, Facebook or LinkedIn, cut your picture out, create a fake ID. Now I go to the bank and try to drain your personal account and I try to drain your business account because most people usually tell what your business is on LinkedIn so I can figure out all the um, businesses you probably have on LinkedIn. So I'm going to try to get your personal account and all your business account to drain those. So. Wow. What are some of the major ways that identity theft happens? The number one thing is I try to fish you. So when I send you this fraudulent text or fraudulent email, when you click on it, it's called a rat. It stands for remote access Trojan. When that gets on your piece. called a rat, did you say? It's it's called a rat. Remote access Trojan. Oh, not like a little uh, (laughs) little thing with a tail that looks kind of. Right. I mean, we, we call it, they call it right because what they're about to do to your PC is pretty grimy. So then I can take over your PC. Anything you log is going to get sent to me. So sooner or later, you're going to put your password. Then when you leave, I can take over your password. Then a lot of times when I take over your passwords, when I click on your browser history or banks in there, and half the times 
a lot of those sites just go ahead and log me on because I'm on your PC, right? Right, right, right. Because we all have Chrome or yeah. whatever, and it's we can't remember our bloody passwords because we have so many of them. So we yeah. let our system just populate That's, it, right? You need to. I'd rather have you write them down and put them underneath your computer before you put them in Chrome. Number one is for me to steal it, I would physically have to break in your house. Well, I never save any of my passwords in Chrome, but you know we can get pluses and minuses to that. But when they fish you, I take over your PC and lot of the time when you click on it on your phone, I take over your phone and half the time I can capture your password to your PayPal, your Cash App and your Zelle, right? Yeah. So that's how I try to take over and uh, well, train so, your business accounts and your personal accounts. So these phishing ones, I mean, I probably got about six of them today just alone. And they say either things like, we have a problem with your Amazon account. Please click here to verify your password, right? Yeah. It doesn't come from Amazon.com, mm-hmm. which I guess is one of the things you should do when you look at those is make sure that it even even looks legit because I think most of them, if you look at them, it comes from an email you wouldn't recognize. Or they say things like, um, thanks for purchasing... Um, What's the software? The Uh, Norton Utilities. Norton Utilities. Thank you for purchasing Norton Mm -hmm. Anti Theft, and you know we're we're charging your account two hundred and sixty dollars per year instructions. If you have questions about that, click here, or that doesn't sound right. Um, And then I got another one that said, "I've been watching you, and I'm sorry to tell you I have access to everything." And if you don't wire me X amount of money in Bitcoin within 24 hours, I'm going to take over your computer and cause terrible havoc. So those are three that I seem to get all the time. I don't know know if I'm unique, but I bet I'm not. No, you're far from unique. And that's why I tell people, um, especially from Amazon, those links are getting pretty good because what they do instead of the M, it's an R and the N. So if you don't really look real close, that looks like an M. So a lot of times they're, they're getting pretty good, better with their with their links and all. But if Amazon sends your email, just log on to your account. Don't click on the phishing. Just log on to Amazon. If they're looking for you, it'll be on their website when, it, when you log on. Right. So if somebody said, buy some, I have a low limit credit card that I use specifically for the Internet. I can log on my that uh, credit card and see if. If I really made any purchases or if anything, it, you know, attacked me. And, and I use that credit card with only a thousand dollar limit because if somebody hacks it or steals it, they can't run it up. Right. right. So, so right. I have a that, That's a good. Well, I think the moral of the story is at least that I've read elsewhere. And I, I'm curious if you agree is if in doubt, never, ever click through any of those links. hundred percent. There's very few links I click on my email or my phone. I, I'm going to go to that website. And usually if I do business on the Internet, I'm going to use a very large retailer that's widely known. So, yeah. So phishing comes in other kinds of forms, you know, where I mm-hmm. got scammed. And I don't know if this is actually phishing or not. Maybe this is some other form of it. But um, you know how you log on to something in Apple and your phone will get this message and they'll say, someone has accessed your Apple account from, for me, it would be Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So I I see that and I go, okay, well, I, I know that was me. But one day I got this little pop-up and it said, someone has just accessed your Apple account from blah, 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 China. If this is not you, click here. Oh, boy, that was that dumb. I <laughs> saw that and I went, that's not me. And I clicked uh, it like that. Yeah. and they got me. Yeah, because like, we're getting better. Hackers are getting better. Some of those, like I still call those phishing, they're excellent and they're going to get a high volume of people. So don't feel bad. It's, you just got kind of loop. We're getting better. They're getting better. I seen some stuff I almost clicked on. I was like, ooh, that, that was pretty good. So, uh, but no, like you said, those are 
are excellent, right? So the question is, why didn't Apple block it since it wasn't from Apple, right? So. Well, absolutely. And then I started seeing that my Walmart password had been changed and my Facebook account was being changed. And it was freaking me out. It was it was yeah. freaking me out. I just think uh, what this is sad to say is, and I'll do this with large company, small businesses need to practice on that when that happens, because it's going to happen. So you need to have all your sites written down or in another location so you can easily get on them and change your password. You need to do the two-factor authentication. Most people hit you where you put the password and you call your phone. So you need to go through and make sure you have all that set up. And as a small business, you're going to get hacked. So you need to say, okay, this is where all my accounts is. This is where I need to change them. These are help desk i know i need to call or if i take a picture of my driver's license they will override the hackers so they need to go through and write all those that it's called incident response but i work with small businesses so they can practice that maybe a little bigger than 10 but you will get hacked so you need to know the steps you need to take because like you said you're going to freak out but if you practice and okay if my facebook got hacked i know it's two-factor and this is what I need to do with my Instagram, because most people have a business Facebook, a business Instagram. So right. they need to go through and kind of practice like, OK, this gets hacked. What do I need to do to get me unhacked? Do I got the two factor where they're going to call my phone? Is there a number I can call if I take a picture of my ID? They'll let me override them, but they need to practice that because you, you're going to get hacked. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you make there, John, which is when you get hacked not Mm -hmm. if when right Mm -hmm. i think that's an important distinction very i work with billion dollar companies it's called incident response the government makes us practice that once a year and they're billion dollar companies they have the best security on the planet and they practice so i tell small people you need to practice too (laughs) well you know what it's interesting (laughs) one of the things that i noticed that Google does. You know, Google keeps yeah. the passwords if you mm-hmm. let it or don't tell it not to. But they'll tell you, oh, you know, you need to change these passwords because mm-hmm. they were uh, recently subject to a data breach. And mm-hmm. I mean, lots of stuff is out there, you know, oh. lots of accounts. And I, you mm-hmm. don't know how real it is or not, but you got to figure Google's telling you it for a reason. But, you know, some of it's old stuff, and it's like, how how do you even close down some of these accounts, you know? All right, that, that's an excellent point. Number one, Google's very efficient, and it's called the dark web. So when password gets released on a dark web, the FBI and some of the bigger companies have shields and fake accounts. So they get those big, large password files, go through them. If they see their domain name in it, they'll tell you, the user, that, we found your username on a dark web and somebody's probably got your password. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so the, the dark web is a, is a, it's, it's a different place and not, not a nice place, but so, yeah, that's one thing the bigger companies are starting to do to help their, their clientele because they want to want you to still have faith in there. So they try to work with you by like saying dark web, they have people out there looking for your passwords it's called Pong, meaning somebody got you. So there's websites out there that that uh, scours out there and looks for your username. And if it's out there, they believe your password has been compromised. Wow. Well, I, I'm just so astounded. You know, these are some of them are accounts I maybe used once. It makes me really reluctant to set up accounts online because once you set them up, they're mighty difficult to shut down. They're a lot of work, you know? They are, but um, the sad point is, the sad and good part is, the internet makes everything efficient and easier to use, but people like me was doing the internet in the 80s, there was no security. So when the internet grew up, there was no security. Now they're trying to bolt it on at the end. So they're trying to integrate security into something that wasn't really designed for security. So, um, but they're getting better and uh, we're different products and uh, procedures you can do to help you because everybody's now on an MFA, right? You put your password and it calls your phone. Most banks do that. Then, so somebody's got to steal your password and steal your phone and get into your account, right? So, yeah, that's what you're talking about with two-factor yeah. identif- yeah. identification, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. 
We've talked about fishing. Where mm-hmm. are some of the other kinds of risks that small yeah. businesses really need to think about? Okay, the cause of that is, like you said, people call you on your phone, right? With They call that phishing with a V. Then a lot of times I've seen a lot of people say, oh, your PayPal was hacked, your Zelle. And the same thing, when you give that person access, they're going to take all your money out your Zelle and you're going to figure out Zelle didn't call you or Chase didn't call you or that certain bank didn't call you, right? So same thing. And you, they said, well, they need your phone to take it over because somebody withdrew a certain amount. Then when you do that, they're going to withdraw the rest of your money out. So that's well, fishing well, with the V. Go well, ahead. Let, let's talk about how that works because, mm-hmm. you know, it's really interesting to me. I will get calls from mm-hmm. my own credit card companies or other companies and they'll they'll call you and the first thing they call it they will say this is chase bank we need you to identify yourself i yes. think companies have to do a the legit companies mm-hmm. are having a hard time getting people to provide information because i'm like you called me i'm not <laughs> giving you anything and they're like well that's our process you have to and i believe them but it's like how do I even know who the who the legit ones are anymore? You know, yeah, that that is really bad. And I, I've actually argued with banks like you do. It's like, did you call me? So I think we're trying to work together to figure out the best way to do that. And a lot of times, I piss my bank off. I'm like, I'm gonna log online. I go home and log on. I'm like, what are you trying? Will you? Am I late on a bill? Or you need this? Because you know they got those things they can send you on their website. I'm like, well, I'm logging on. So we're going to have to do it over the computer because I don't know who I'm talking to. So I always go home and log on. So I tell them, I don't trust you. I don't know you. (laughs) Right. I don't know you. You called me. So why why should I believe you're who you say you are? It's hard for legit companies anymore to contact people by phone and get them to provide information. They shouldn't call. The thing they should call you by phone is, Something's bad happened. Go to your local branch or log in. Because I'm not telling you everything. Now, if you need to get contact me, I'll go home and log on. Or if it's bad enough, I'll go to my local branch. I'm not doing anything on my phone. So I, I'm just kind of weird like that. Um, yeah. So. Well, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> anymore, you have to be really careful because there's a lot of pretty sophisticated scammers out there. You know, one of the things I've read a lot about is printers. Do you think that's a really big security risk? What should people think about with their printers? Uh, yeah, printers are uh, very small for a local business, but if you have a MFD, which I guess some smaller, MFD is multifunction, the scanners, the printers, it used to be, you know, you could scan something and fax it to them. Most people don't fax well, it. Well, I have one of those. It's a okay. little, um, HD all-in-one thingy. It's fax, it's scan, yeah. it's uh, print. Is, yeah. so, is that what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Hey. It's for a single person. It's not bad. When you put it on a small network in a small office, it's horrible because there's no security. And most of the times... The network they put it on is connected to the internet. So I can dial into that, log on, and stuff you scan, I can fax it to my email. <laughs> so I can hack your MFD if it's on your network. I could, if you fax something or you scan somewhere, sometimes when you print something, I can actually get it off your drum because it doesn't get deleted. All right. That, that's a little harder though. You got to be up in the hacker realm a little bit, but. When you copy something, it actually gets saved inside. There's a hard drive in there, depending on your printer. It gets saved on that hard drive. So I probably got a couple of days if I hacked into your MFD to get it off. Right. So um, so what should people do? I mean, how do they know how big a risk this is? And if they have what you're talking about, what should they do? If you have your network hooked to the Internet, get your printer off the Internet. <laughs> Nobody should be able to get to the Internet to your printer. Two is if you fax something, just make sure you look at the facts where you fax. And a lot of times people get into your fax and change the contact. It looks like the same name, but if you actually look where it's getting sent, it's getting sent somewhere else. Right. And two is if you're copying credit cards or some PI personal information, 
just run a couple copies over top of that after that because there's a drum inside it'll overwrite that because when you copy your credit card stuff it gets saved internally in a hard drive very small hard drive so if you do a couple blank copies over, it, it's going to erase their hard drive information. So if somebody ever got to it, there will be no information on it. Well, so just so I'm clear, mm-hmm. are you saying that with my little all-in-one printer scanner that I'm better off not doing this Internet wizard thing and just connecting it via the old-fashioned plug that I stick into my computer to connect? Yes, yes. Unless you got a guy that's making sure they can't, it cannot be getting hit from the Internet. But let's back up, though. You probably not, you know, copying super sensitive information. So it depends on what are you running through there. But if we're just talking about from the safety of a hacker, yeah, you should just plug it in. It's just you. Sometimes the Internet thing is not all good. So, Well, so. that's an interesting comment because supposedly we're all supposed to want to have this Internet of things mm-hmm. where everything's connected to the Internet, right? Yeah, 100%. I was on a panel talking about the pluses and minus of the Internet of Things, right? So a uh, big thing is autonomous trucks. They're running down south, right? Uh, they're going to drive your groceries to the top of the highway and somebody's going to get it and drive in there, right? That's connected to the Internet. It so gets the maps from Google Maps. If I take over that mapping, I can drive that truck through downtown and run it into a building because it's connected to the Internet. Right. So I always remember there's pluses and the minus when you connect something to the Internet. I always think in reverse. OK, the convenience of you doing it in the Internet is great. But what if a hacker get through it? Right. Nest, your thermostat connected to the Internet. When you're coming home, you can cut it up, save money. What if I hack your thermostat and cut it up to the highest it can? Worst case is going to blow up. Least case is you're just going to have a high heat bill. Right. So those are pluses and minus to that Internet of Things. So I want people that follow me on YouTube, follow us to take those risks into account. That's all. Yeah. I want you to own the cybersecurity in your house and in your life. So just think about it both ways. Now, great, it's convenient. The odds of somebody hacking it is small, but I just want you to think about it. As like you said, as a savvy entrepreneur, we need to be thinking about this. (laughs) So, uh, Professor, I know you mentioned to me there's a couple of other big areas, things like uh, Dropbox or Google Docs, other document storage things, emails and routers. Let's talk about each of those a little bit and the risks they present and what small businesses should do about that. Let's start with the Dropbox services, Drop and Box. And those services are pretty good. Uh, both of those services have been hacked. So when you put stuff out there, I would use it to transfer. Like I'm putting some out there and my client gets it or my customer gets it or my boss gets it. I wouldn't just leave stuff out there randomly on those services. So Really? So don't put your tax documents out there. <laughs> Do not put your tax documents. Or if you can, just as soon as you drop them, your tax preparer needs to be getting them and you need to be deleting them. So those services are on the web people know they're on there and if you just google it most of those services has been hacked um super rare uh, we could give it a probably a 20 percent chance of happening but we want to try to make it low as possible so once again i wouldn't keep anything of super value out there uh, so no. my mom's favorite recipes are okay probably <laughs> they're great there they, that is <laughs> that that for me, that's what it should be used for. <laughs> so that's a perfect use case for it. Once again, we want people just to understand their risk and, and where it's at, you know, and the best uh, products to use for the purpose that, it's, that they're using it for. Yeah. So don't put the list of your passwords there. For sure, do, not do that. Do not do that. Yeah. It, does that apply to Google Docs too, or is that because it's part of Google a little bit better protected? That's a little bit better because it's it's a Google. But what happens a lot of time is um, people have those passwords saved somewhere on their phone or on their PC. So when their PC gets hacked a lot of times, when you click on that Google Docs, instead of it forcing you to log on, they let it auto log on. So if somebody hacks your PC or your phone and it's connected to those vice, 
that device just opens up, which I, I don't like. But so that's kind of some of the bad things that usually happens with Google Docs and Dropbox. Most people put that on auto log on. I mean, you put the password on it and it saves it. So when you click on it, automatically it opens up. You mentioned routers before we were, when we were chatting before the show started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about about routers. I mean, I'm, I had a, I think a Netgear one that I was mm-hmm. trying to deal with, and it, I, I, I just realized at one point I didn't want to have to keep doing software updates or worrying mm-hmm. about it, so I just got the Xfinity one uh, and mm-hmm. paid the money for it. I don't know if that was smart or not. Um, I would say it's not smart. The the problem I see a lot of times and. I have one of those type routers, not from Xfinity. They never update them. So when I check the firmware, it's like, dude, I had this thing for five years and y'all never updated. <laughs> so I thought they t- were supposed to. If you bought the got your router from Xfinity or AT and T or whoever your provider is, I thought that meant that they were updating the software. No, uh, I had AT and T, and I had to manually up my, my update mine every year. So maybe maybe it's the one I had, and I got a new one. So I think they say that. I think they have other protections in place. They believe that will handle that, but I believe you should be updating your firmware on a yearly basis. The ones I looked at from my AT and T were not updated, so I I can specifically say for AT and T um, that they didn't update them. I mean, it's extra money that you pay to Xfinity or AT&T mm-hmm. or whoever. Are you better off just buying yourself a Netgear one and making sure it's updated? Or I would get the AT&T one. I would just check uh, on a yearly basis and make sure they're updating it. I used to have to call them and force them to push down an update. Um, <laughs> and I did that like a year ago. So, <laughs> so I, know, I was like, hey. I need you to update wow, this router. Time to put that on your calendar, Professor. <laughs> so yeah, so no, I, I would update because you you usually get speed, and they do have some extra security features in there. One of them just wasn't the upgrading of the firmware, right? So um, a lot of people think that's minor and it doesn't happen, but that's how I usually get hacked with minor stuff. So I just make sure it gets updated. So so you're telling me people even that pay the money to Xfinity or AT and T to rent their router into perpetuity are still at risk of getting hacked. How, how significant is that risk? And what happens if it happens? Uh, not significant and uh, nothing's going to happen. The reason why nothing's going to happen is you're a single person. You're not going to sue at and They got a floor of lawyers now. <laughs> it's a class action lawsuit. Um, so once again, we got savvy entrepreneurs. We need to check that ourselves and force the vendor to update. Right? It's on our checklist. We're trying to get a little more thorough with cybersecurity. So we need to take responsibility for our cyber life. That's what I call it on YouTube. We about this cyber life. We got to take it seriously. So we're going to do those checks. And if they don't happen, we're going to reach out to the vendor and make sure they happen. So let's touch on email. And then I want to talk about passwords. Mm -hmm. How often are emails hacked beyond the phishing? And then what should people think about or do about that? Uh, (laughs) uh, You remember solar winds and colonial pipeline? You know, I don't know about that. Tell us about that. If you remember, people were putting gas in trash bags about a year ago because the East Coast got shut down by one of the big gas refineries. That was because they got hacked through email and it was a large government entity. About eight large government organizations got hacked through email. So, um, how did I miss that? Holy buckets. You probably heard of it. it. You just didn't know it was a cyber issue. You thought it was another type of issue. So, yeah, both of those were done through uh, big email hacks, actually through Office 365 from Microsoft, which I think is the most secure email system on the planet. So, once again, um, you're going to get hacked through email sooner or later. You're going to get tricked by fish or somebody's going to hack your email. So that's why we we need to practice that when it's going to happen. Once again, it's going to happen. Go ahead. (laughs) I'm just thinking... um... I'm a lawyer by training, so you have to do your uh, continuing legal education, and one Mm -hmm. of the ones that I did was on cybersecurity for lawyers, and the person who did the seminar was like, you need to be encrypting your emails, and I was like, whoa, (laughs) really? Seriously, you need to be doing that? Well, you, I mean, as a lawyer, you got client attorney privileges, and you just, depending on the type of cases you have, 
you got a lot of people personal information in their email. I mean, you have everything from horrific crimes to I'm stealing from other companies. The, the cool thing, though, is it's, it's easy to cre- encrypt the email now. But yeah, yes, you should be encrypting email. And I work for large companies that we really encrypt our email. Well, I guess I was just thinking it, it kind of a risk assessment, right? Because mm-hmm. if you're just chatting with a client saying, you know, we want a project kickoff meeting and when are you available? That's probably not a big deal. But if you were a personal injury lawyer and you were talking about, you know, transmitting people's medical records or you're dealing with uh, financial transactions where, where there's sensitive information, I guess whether you're a lawyer or you're just, you know, you're sending that kind of information as a business, that maybe is an area you need to think about pretty long and hard. If you send in any PII, I would encrypt your email. If you do, if you're in Office 365 or Gmail, even has encryption now. It's just so easy to do. And uh, as you, as a lawyer, you know, if you don't take the proper steps, you are negligent, and your fine could be extra big. So we well, want to make sure negligence is not in there. So by hitting a button, encrypting an email. We take negligence off the table, sir. Well, so talk about that. Is there an easy way if you're sending stuff in Outlook, how do you, maybe you've got a YouTube video on. Speaking of which, we haven't talked about your YouTube channel and all the helpful tips that people can find out there. I have one coming. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we're going to do that, uh, especially from small to medium-sized businesses. Encrypt an email, we believe, should just be straight out the box. You can do it at Google and a couple other services pretty easy. And we should just do that by having, even for non-sensitive information and getting that habit, right? So you just click a button and it's encrypted and just send an email like, like you regularly do. Tell people about your uh, YouTube channel and some of the resources that are out there and how they can find you. Okay. I appreciate that. Just like it says, Professor Black Ops, I one word. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. I have three phases of my YouTube channel. One of them, like we talked about, is for regular people. We've been talking about uh, encryption on the phone, phishing on the phone, um, making sure you're, you know, put your thermostat on the internet that could uh, cause you problems. So uh, cybersecurity for regular people. Then I do cybersecurity for a, a mid to a large businesses. Like we were talking about, it's called Fair Ramp and different compliances, HIPAA, people familiar with that. Uh, purpose for kids, for education. And the other thing I do is helping people get into cybersecurity to make a decent living. We know it's hard out here to, to find a good job sometimes. So you come to me and we're trying to get you into cybersecurity by passing uh, certifications. And the last big thing is we call uh, society big cybersecurity things, mass surveillance, bail bonds for people. So there's big societal things that are coming up. Uh, Like we talked about autonomous driving. Are you cool with your government surveilling you so we can catch the bad person, right? All of those are going to be voted on in the Supreme Court coming up. So we talk a little bit about that on uh, security just to get, especially young people, because I always tell them, that's the stuff you got to vote on. I'm done. I'm I got about 10 years and I'm retiring, man. So I need y'all to figure out what y'all want to do from a, a mass surveillance and, and different other projects that the government's going to do. Well, so talk about mass surveillance. Mm-hmm. Are you talking about like drones flying overhead looking for mm-hmm. my marijuana patch in my backyard? No, or it, what it, are you it, talking it's, about? It's something so small you don't even realize that happened. The biggest surveillance network in this country right now is Ring Doorbell. What? Ring do- I'm a fantasy. I knew you were going to be shocked. I can see your eyes. Even though I- Ring Doorbell, what happens is you- when you sign up for 50% discount, all those streams go through your local police station. So if you're walking past somebody's house that has Ring, your face is ending up at the police station. Then part of what the police can do is they have facial recognition. So they can take pictures and go through all those streams in seconds. So when you go on Facebook, your picture comes up. You type your name, it brings the rest of those pictures up. That's facial recognition. So when Ring sends your picture to the police station, that's what they're doing with those streams of pictures. Right? So Wow. 
so my one of my lives we talked about that do you know that no do you care so then that was the big discussion Uh, i don't know i think a lot of people have it because they like to know was an amazon driver at my doorstep or i'm fine uh, with that it shouldn't go to the police station though that's all i'm saying you can have your own local it goes to your little drive box and gets deleted after 30 days i'm fine with that but it shouldn't go down to the police station. And now when the FBI is looking for something, they can go through all those 20 million ring doorbells in all of the United States. That's mass surveillance. <laughs> so those are some things we're talking. It's weird. It's usually by age. People over 40 don't care. People under 35 wants to go to war. So it's just real interesting. <laughs> that. That, that makes me still laugh again about I don't want the show to be political here, but no, you know, but people, political. some of the the myths out there about the COVID vaccine, mm-hmm. people not wanting to get the vaccine because they were convinced there were nanoparticles oh. that were going to allow the government to track mm-hmm. it, and I I just laughed. I mean, first oh. of all, I have a friend who's a doctor who's like, I'm sorry, we don't have that technology yet. Right, so. But number two, the government already has so much information Mm. out there about all of us, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, some people like it, but I find it a little creepy. I'm, Mm. you know, I'm looking at shoes and then I look Mm. at a website and then I go off and I'm looking at the news. The next thing I know, there's pop-ups all over the place with Mm. shoes that I might be interested in. Well, how did that happen, I wonder? We know. They tr- they tell you they track you across the web. Now, the big thing is when you say it and it comes up on your phone, so the, the big debate is, is your phone really listening to your shoes? So that's the debate. But re- real quick, back on that non-political is, is I always tease the young people. I said, uh, the last thing you have to worry about is the vaccine tracking you. You never put down your phone. Right. <laughs> You take your phone to the bathroom. I always joke with the kids. I'm like, young player, when you, your phone's got the most tracking on it, even when you cut off tracking, the phone system's triangulating your phone. That's how you get a call. They know where that phone is at. So until you put down your phone, don't worry about the vaccine. You got to drop your phone first before you worry about the vaccine. Young man. So well, people are never going to do that. They're right. They're so that's so, their phone like crap. Come so on. that's what I told them. I said, your Trump, your phone, and shout out to Google. Their mapping is for free. It's the best mapping on the planet because you never put it down. Right, right. In fact, they said um, they could track pretty closely how much people were actually following, you know, stay at home orders and stuff Mm -hmm. because and and traffic to restaurants. That's how they I I mean, they they know all that because Google was gathering all of it. Right. It wasn't wasn't even Google. All the kids say, oh, I want to be cool. I'm checking in this restaurant. You you, you tell the face. You don't Google don't have to tell you. You told Facebook or Instagram. You took a picture of your food. <laughs> and most pictures people don't realize is unless you cut off longitude, the longitude and latitude is on the picture you took. Right, right. Uh, five million selfies tracking you all over yeah. wherever you've been, every place you've been for the last five years, right? So, so I always tell people, I'm not telling you anything about the vaccine. You can make your own decision, but your phone is a bigger problem than, than the shot. I don't care what you do with it. Like you said, I don't care what's sad on you. Put down your phone if you're really worried about that. All right. So put your future glasses on. Mm. What do you see as the biggest issues coming over the horizon? Oh, now I got to be careful. Where? I got to take a deep breath (laughs) because I get on a lot of debates with a lot of people. The riskiest thing to me is you you never even thought about this is uh, the metaverse pacifying the next generation. Are you talking about uh, wearables and things like yes, that? Yes, metaverse is where you put goggles on and you're in this augmented reality. So I believe that's going to pacify the next generation and you're not going to get the scholars and the intellectual thinking people you need because I believe they're doing the metaverse to kind of pacify a population. So oh, my. I'm just going to tap like out at that. I'm, I'm going to tap out at that. Go ahead. Wow. That's like uh, the Matrix is becoming reality, huh? Uh, facts. It's more player ready player one if you ever saw that. But yes. You know, I read the book, actually. OK, OK. A phenomenal I'm, book. So we're going to touch on this real quick for all the entrepreneurs. Machine learning, augmented reality, 
virtual reality and robotics is going to take away 30 million jobs in the next 20 years. So you got to be on the right side of that. Wow. Right? So we got to make sure that technology is used in the appropriate way, right? We know farmers now, they got automatic combines, right? We used to do need a lot more people. And there used to be a thousand people in a typing pool. Not only people type letters, gets the secretaries the C-suite. It used to be a thousand AAs. So that's technology moving and creatively destroying jobs. You got to make sure you're on the other side where you get one of those jobs that are created, not destroyed. Right. And there will be lots of jobs in data security. And so speaking of lots of jobs, how can people reach you if they're interested in maybe having you consult or they just want to shoot the breeze with you or pick your brain about something Uh, or you know maybe they're interested in a career in data security because there are going to be a lot of jobs i think in in that area what's the best way for folks to reach you professor black ops on youtube or professor black ops at gmail.com just shoot me an email I usually respond in 48 hours, but come check out my come check out my YouTube and it, there's a section on there with how to get into cybersecurity. Um, a lot of times people don't want a college degree. So there's certifications you can get that can kind of ease you in the industry and start making money without uh, having the huge expense of college. So those are some of the things we talk about. And one of the big debates is certifications versus a uh, degree. So come check me out on YouTube and uh, I'm sure we can link up. Thanks so much, John, Professor, PBO, um, (laughs) for joining me this week. Just chock full of great information. Uh, Such an interesting and honestly kind of scary topic and one that I think most of us need to pay a little more attention to and be more mindful about. So thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your thoughts and recommendations with me this week. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening, folks. Um, And again, a special thanks to my guest today, John Hightower, a.k.a. Professor Black Ops, talking this week about data privacy and data security, things you can do with your small business to help protect yourself. You can find more helpful information and resources on my website, globalocityservices.com, as well as my new website dedicated to the radio show, thesavvyentrepreneur.org. And uh, it's going to get populated with more and more blog, things like blogs, tools, pop, podcasts, and other free resources. I'd love to hear from you. My door's always open for comments, questions, or suggestions. Or if you just want to shoot the breeze, email me anytime at dnagel, N-A-G-E-L, at thesavvyentrepreneur.org. You'll always get a response back from me, I promise. Now, be sure to join me again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. But until then, I'm Doris Nagel, wishing you happy entrepreneurship.